please. And I'm going to read some scripture here this morning. I feel like the Lord's placed on my heart. You listen carefully to the reading of God's word. This is why we're here. We have no right to exist if this is not God's word. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I'm going to preach this morning on the subject, 12 hours to live. 12 hours to live. Here's a man in the Bible that God put in the Bible for us to read about that had 12 hours to live and did not know it. He, this man wasn't in the hospital on life support. This man was not laying there where people say, well, we've already given him up. It's only a matter of time. This man was not in there with machines and tubes hooked to his body and, and his family standing around saying, he's going to go any minute. Uh-uh. This guy was healthy. This guy was, how do we know that? He was building buildings. He was having other buildings tore down. He was planting crops. He had ground, he had land. He had, uh, he had plans. He said, I'm going to get all this stuff done. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. In his mind, he said, we're gonna, as soon as I get this new building built, we're going to have a big cookout. We're going to have all my friends over. We're going to cook out hamburgers and steaks and grill out. He said, we're going to eat, we're going to drink, and we're going to be merry. He said, we're going to have a big time. So there wasn't nothing wrong with him. He wasn't like, it, it was, un, he, 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 there wasn't nothing wrong with him, friend. He said, uh, uh, he, he come in and they said, he didn't know that he only had 12 hours. Now look, if you know you're dying, you got a little time to fix things up a lot of times. But he didn't know it. He didn't know it. There was nothing wrong with him that he knew of. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, that old barn looking out there, I got so much money in the bank, I think I'm just going to tire that down and build me a nicer one. And when I get it built, I'm going to get everybody over here and we're going to have a big party and we're going to live it up. And about that time, God looked down from heaven and said, you fool, you're going to be dead in 12 hours. You, t- tonight, I'm going to take your soul away from you. And then what good's all this stuff going to do to you? That's what I want to preach about this morning. 12 hours to live. Now the truth is this morning is that none of us in here know how long we've got on this earth to live. None of us. Nobody in here tonight, this morning knows how long you've got. You may have 12. I may have 12 or less. We just don't know. The thing about it is God knows. God knows the second when everybody in here will die. So I'm going to have to put myself saying, Lord, it could be me. It could be you. There could be somebody sitting in here this morning that has less than a day to live and you don't know it. I want to preach about that just for a few minutes. That's a very, that's a very scary thought. That's a very sobering line of thinking but it could be you. And if, and if there's people in here sitting here saying, well, I just had a checkup, my, doctor, my blood pressure's good, my heart rate's fine, he ain't talking to me, you don't know that. 
You don't know that at all. So the first thing I want to say this morning is if you knew you had 12 hours to live, the first thing you'd do, you'd want to be sure of your salvation. You'd want to be sure. You may play around with it now and act like it's not important, but if you knew that you had 12 hours to go, you'd say, I'm going to make sure that I'm saved. I want to be saved and know it. Now, uh, you'd be surprised people don't know that. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 uh, that you can know. The Bible said in John 20 and verse 31, these things are written unto you that believe on, Jesus, uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ, um, that believe in his name that you might have life through his name. You ought to be saved and know you're saved. Now, if you're not sure you're saved here this morning, if you go through life saying, well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I hope I am. I think I am. Maybe, I'm, Lord, if I'm going to die today, I don't know if I am or not. I don't know. You'd be shocked that the people, if you knew you had 12 hours to live, would not know for sure that you're saved. Now, if you don't know you're saved, there's one of three things wrong with you. Number one, you're really not saved. Number two, you are dependent on living a certain life in order good enough to be saved and you don't ever know if you've done good enough or not that's making you doubt it or number three you've let the world come between you and the Lord and got sin in your heart and it's making you doubt now one of them three things is wrong with you if you don't know that you're going to heaven when you leave this world if you don't know it one of them things ain't wrong now if I was you you know what I'd do if I was you and I didn't know I was saved I'd get in this altar this morning and I'd say, somebody take the Bible, I want to know what the Bible says, and tell me. I heard about this lady, she's uh, on a train trip years ago when people used to travel by trains. And uh, uh, she was sitting there and she wasn't sure she's on the right train. And she turned to the person next to her and said, uh, pardon me, ma'am, uh, is this train going to St. Louis? And the lady said, uh, yes, it, it sure is. And said, but I don't, how, I'm not sure, how do you know? How do you know? And she said, well, that's, that's what they tell me. And she turned to the man beside her and said, is this train going to St. Louis? He said, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You people are just like me. How do you know? About that time, the conductor come in. And the conductor of the train was take, taking a break, come back to the train. She said, excuse me, sir, is this train going to St. Louis? He was driving it. He said, yes, ma'am, it's going to St. Louis. If you're on this train, you're going to St. Louis. I'm driving. And she calmed down, and, got, and she was all right after that. You know, a lot of people depend on so-and-so. A lot of people say, Mama told me I was saved. A lot of people told me, uh, Daddy said I got saved when I was in Bible school. Uh, my, they told me I got saved when I was little. But you know, you can't depend on what people around you say. Some say you are, some say you ain't. But I'm going to tell you something, buddy. I got the word of the conductor right here. I got the one that's driving the train. I got the one that's flying, the, flying us in. I got the one that's going to land us safe on the other side. And here's what he said. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now what you ought to do this evening, get in this altar, if it takes more, you go home, go out there in the woods somewhere and get down behind a pine tree and say, God, I want to know. God, I don't want nothing between me and you. God, eternity's long, hell's hot. Heaven's wonderful. It's going to be forever. I don't want to take no chances. God, I want to know where I'm going when I die. You, you, uh, it's not a feeling. It is not a feeling. It is taken by faith that he meant what he said in this book right here and by faith in that book. I'm glad it's that way. People say, well, I just wish I could feel something. You can't trust your feelings. Feelings come and go. You feel saved one day and feel lost the next. I'm glad God fixed it where it's solid no matter how you feel. No matter how you feel. We've got the word of the king. We've got the word of the conductor. We've got the word of the boss. The boss said, if we trust Jesus Christ, we're going to heaven. And by his grace, that's where I'm going. I know I'm going to heaven because I did what he said. You said, well, how do I know if I trusted him? Look, you trusted that chair you sat down. You trust that chair you, or you wouldn't have sat on it. You say, I believe that chair is going to hold me up. See, I trusted it right there. That's what I do with my soul to Jesus Christ. 
Whenever I die, I say, it's on you, Jesus. It's on you. I, I believe you'd want to make sure of your salvation. Number two, number two, I believe if you had 12 hours to live, you'd want to be a part of a good Bible-believing church. Many people say, um, uh, I, I, I just, I'm disillusioned with church. I hear people say that all the time. We get emails of people say, I don't even go to church. I'm, I'm fed up with all a bunch of hypocrites and everybody in church is a hypocrite. And that, that ain't true, by the way. And, but that's what the, they want to believe as an excuse not to go at all. And you can find something wrong with every church. You can find something wrong with every group of people. But I'm telling you one thing. If you knew you was going to die this evening, you would want to report into heaven and say, I was a part of a Bible-believing church. There is something to this church business. There is something special and supernatural about congregating together and going to church. It's not an accident. It's, it's important to be active, to be faithful, the Bible said Jesus died for the church. The Bible said he's coming back after the church. That makes the church the most important thing on planet earth to God. The church, that's what he died for. That's what he's coming after. I'm telling you, it is important. Since, uh, since, since you don't know, since you don't know that you're not gonna live another day, another day, I'd join today if I was you, and I'm not doing that to try to recruit members. I'm, I'm just saying, if I, if I knew I had to die tonight, I'd join the church this morning. I'd say, sign up, I wanna be a part of it. You know, the Bible said over there, oh, Saul, Paul got saved and he's called him Saul there for a while before his name changed. The Bible said in Acts 9, 26, it said when Saul got saved, he came to Jerusalem to join himself to the disciples. He wanted to join. That don't mean necessarily they kept a church role like we do now, but he said, I want to be a part of this group. I want to be a part of this group. I believe that you'd want to be a part of a good church if you knew you had to die this evening. Uh, people live like the church ain't important. Galavan all over creation on Sunday. Don't matter if you go or don't matter if you don't go. God understands. No, he don't. He said not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And people have military funerals. People have Masonic funerals. People have all kind of weird funerals uh, when they die. I tell you what, when I die, and if I die in 12 hours, I want people to put it on the radio, put it in the newspaper. Danny Castle was a part of Shining Light Baptist Church. He was a member there. You'd want to be a part of a church if you had to die in 12 hours. Masons ain't gonna help you a bit when it's dying time. The Shriners, the Kiwanis Club ain't gonna help you a bit when it's dying time, buddy. Amen? Uh, the military funeral will not take you to heaven when it's dying time. You'll wanna be a part of a good church. I heard about uh, this preacher, he's preaching revival. And he preached revival and the first night he noticed this man and, and he assumed it was his wife sitting there. Man nodded off and slept through the whole thing and it bothered him. It does any preacher when that happens. And the second night on Tuesday night, he noticed again that man just nodded off and slept through the whole service. He noticed on Wednesday night, the same thing happened. That man just nodded off, slept through the whole service. He's getting aggravated. He thought, my good night, how disrespectful can you get? Can't even stay awake in church for a few minutes and everything. On Thursday it happened again and his wife come up to the preacher. She said, preacher, I just want to thank you for coming and preaching this revival. And she said, I want to thank you so much for understanding about my husband. She said, my husband has stage four cancer. She said, the doctors told him he's got less than two weeks to live. She said, preacher, he can't stay awake because of the medication they got him on. The medication is so strong, he can't hold his head up. But he told me he wanted to be in church his last week of his life. You know, I heard people, I heard about somebody not long ago. They, they've had a bad heart attack and thought they ought to, you know, maybe travel around the world or something like that and say, I want to see all the world I, I, I can see because I'm getting ready to die. Listen, man, if I'm getting ready to die, I don't care about seeing the world. I've seen enough of it. I've seen too much of this world. It's all the same. The grass ain't greener over yonder in California than it is here. 
Somebody said, well, the grass is greener over there. I want to go 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 there. You know where the grass is greener? Over top of a septic tank. That's what they got in California. That's what it is. Amen. That's right. And I'm telling you this, this morning, people, listen, you, you, if I had hours to live, I'd want to be in church. Number three, number three, if you had 12 hours to live, you would want to make your wrongs right. You sure would. Old Zacchaeus, when he got saved there, he come down that sycamore tree and he said, Lord, if I've done somebody wrong, I want to go make it right with them. You know what? You ought to do that. You ought to do that. And you would do it. So you know, a lot of people make these deathbed confessions and, and repentance. On the, and, and it's a, I mean, that's better than nothing. Uh, but it's a very, very dangerous thing to try to wait till you're dying. Because the man here had no warning. He wasn't laying there for days to get his heart right. He just probably fell over dead with a heart attack just like that. Heart with it. It's happened in church. It has happened in church. I read a story of a lady who rode the church bus one Sunday morning and went out and walked out the inside, walked out the door, sat down on the church bus and fell over dead with a heart attack. On the church bus. It happens all the time. It happens right while I'm preaching. Bam, 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 bam. Two every second in this world dying all over the place. You would want to make your wrongs right. There's a lot of people laying on their deathbed. Say, call mama, call daddy, call my cousin, call my wife, call my kids. And right there on their deathbed say, look, I got to tell you something. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I was wrong. But the problem with this guy, he didn't have that time to get ready. If you knew you had 12 hours, you'd want to make your wrongs right. Number four. You listening? If you knew you had 12 hours to live, you'd want to be right on the money question. You would. I would. If I'd robbed God all these years and stole my offering from God, I'm not, I'm not one of these preachers preaching for money. I ain't preaching for money. I don't preach for money. I preach them before I ever had this church. I'll be preaching after I'm gone, if I ever get gone. It's not about money. It was you, I know that God wants me to do my part in the church for the work of God to support missionaries, to run them buses, to keep fuel in them, to keep them going. And listen, if I was to die today and I was a year behind on my giving, I'd say, I want to catch up, Lord. I want to get it right. You'd want to be right on the money question. You say, well, how do you know he had any? The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He was loaded. If you can just tear a building down just for something to do and build you another, you got some money. He could have gave God his part and died with a clear conscience, but I guarantee you he was by, way behind. Listen, people, he could have put it where moth don't corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal. You may brush it off now, but one day you'll wish you was right on your money question. I heard about this man up in Canada, 24 years of age, and he came in and robbed a bank up there somewhere and he had his pistol, he'd stole his pistol from somebody, and there's a gun collection. And he took his pistol and robbed the bank and got $6,000 off of that, out of that bank. And they caught him, of course. And they got that gun that he used, and it was a collector's item. And the gun was worth $100,000. He took a $100,000 gun, got $6,000 with it, and wound up in prison. He didn't know what he had in his hand. You hear me? I said he didn't know what he had in his hand. We sit here this morning and we think, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. You don't realize what you got. Right in your hand, people, right in your hand. He said, put it up there where moth don't corrupt, where thieves can't break through and steal. Put it in one of them buses. Put that, put that, put that money in there. Run, do something for God with it. Don't die if you're not right in your heart. Have you been stealing God's money? That's scriptural. Malachi, he said, have we robbed God? Are you robbing God this morning? Don't get mad at me. It's not my fault. I put mine in there a minute ago. If I had 12 hours to live, I'd want to be right on my money question. I don't want to die. With my heart. You say, well, Brother Danny, I just can't afford it. That's why. That's why. You quit stealing, the Lord might bless you. Number five, and I'm through. 
If I had to die in 12 hours, I'd want to take somebody with me. I'd want to take somebody with me. The great tragedy, greatest probably tragedy of the 20th century was the Titanic going down. That's terrible. One of the greatest. And you know what made it sad among all the other bad stuff that happened? You know what made it sad? They said when the Titanic went down, that the half them lifeboats wasn't even half full of people. They, five or six of them jumped in that boat and they could have held 12 or 15 or whatever. They could hold 25 or whatever. And they'd sail out through here a little bit and they could hear people screaming going down in the water. But they said, no, we're not getting near that. That wreckage might pull us under. And they just let them drown and save themselves. That's awful. Don't judge them. If, if me and you'd have been there that night, we might have done the same thing. I don't know. But I tell you, I thought about all them people that could have been saved that night if a bunch of people hadn't just turned around and said, we don't care. We're, going to, we're saved. We ain't worrying about you. And tens of thousands and thousands of Christians in their country this morning say, I'm saved. I don't care about nobody else. What have you done to take somebody with you, people? What have you done to take somebody with you? Amen? I've heard of, I've heard of houses being on fire and a kid in the house and firemen have to hold people back, women ready to fight through flames in order to try to save a child. It happens, happens many, many times. And the women will say, I'll, I'll, I'll walk through them flames to save my house. And I thought, Lord, in mercy, people in this world burning in hell, they're going to wind up in hell. They're going to wind up burning forever and ever and ever and ever. If we knew you had 12 hours to live, you'd want to take somebody with you. I witnessed the two young ladies yesterday on the bus route over yonder in town at some apartments. And I knocked on the door. Little boy about that high came to the door. And I said, hey, our church sends a bus through here on Sunday. Would y'all like to go to church? And that little boy, he's about five years old. said, yeah, yeah, I want to go. Is it today? And I said, no, there ain't nobody there today. I said, but we'll go tomorrow. And his mama and another lady had just moved into apartments. Three kids all together, two ladies, probably in their mid-twenties. Both of them said, we want to come. She said, is it a Baptist church? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. She said, okay. She said, we want to come. They didn't make it this morning. But I gave another man a flyer, and I gave them one and said, listen, we want you to come to church. We want you to come to church. We want you to come to church. I dreamed about this man the other night. I don't even know who it was. You ever had a dream that's real, real about somebody, but in your dream... You're talking to him, but you, you, you don't know who it was. It was a man about 60 years of age, and he was dying. And as he was dying, I was screaming at him. And I, I'd been studying this stuff about the concerts and stuff, and I said, real church is the best thing in the world, friend. Real church is the best thing in the world. Real church is the best thing in the world. Listen, don't, y'all don't let the devil blind you. Don't let the devil blind you. If you get your heart right with the Lord this morning and really give it all to God, I mean everything, give it all to the Lord, you'd be the happiest you've ever been in your life. Amen. You say, well, I can't live it, preacher. You're absolutely right. You can't. I can't either. None of us can. He has to do it through you. He has to do it for you. He has to do it with you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you knew, if you just knew, if you just knew how wonderful it is to be forgiven and know your name's in heaven and know the, your name's in the book of life, and God's with you. There is nothing in the world better than that. Nothing in this world. You'd want to be right. You'd want to take somebody with you if you had 12 hours to live. Can anybody in here guarantee that you got 12 hours? No. preacher called me from up north this week. He said, I want to ask you a question. I said, shoot, buddy. He said, how in the world do you maintain your energy level? I said, I don't, I don't even know if I know what that means. I said, I reckon it's, 
I don't know. You inherited it. I reckon. I don't know. And he said, you, you, you do this and you do that. And, you, and I do. I do try. But my daddy was just like me. Never sick. Never stopped. He's worse. You couldn't carry on a conversation with him. He'd be out the door. Gone. The fellow did have a heart attack just like that. See, we don't know. That could happen to me today. My daddy worked all day long, went coon hunting all night. And he'd come in about 5 o'clock that morning, got in the bed. It got time to go to church. Mom woke up and said, aren't you going to church? He said, you go on to Sunday school. I'll be there for preaching. And that was the last thing she ever heard him say. I'll be there for preaching. He wasn't there. She thought he just went back to sleep. Me and the girls over there, we went to a restaurant to eat. I don't know. I know Carrie remembers it. The other two, I don't know if y'all do or not. Somebody come back over and they said, they thought y'all might be here. The EMS called the restaurant where they thought we went. They said, Danny, you better get home with your daddy. And my daddy was laying in the floor. Never got to tell him bye. Never got to say, I love you. Nothing like that. He had 12 hours to live and didn't know. He went coon hunting all night long. He didn't know. Daddy got saved. My daddy got saved about 10 years before he died. Did real good. He drank really strong and heavy for years. He finally quit drinking. Got saved. Daddy made it in by the grace of God. If you knew you had 12 hours to live from right now, I wonder what you'd do. I want you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody's talking. Nobody's, please, don't move. Please, respect God. Pray for conviction. Pray for conviction. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's moving. This is the most important time we've had this morning, right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here this morning, maybe you don't know what would happen to you if you had 12 hours to live. Something's already coming. Why don't you just get out of your seat, make your way down here and get this thing right. Come on. Come on, friend. You've been thinking about it. It's been bothering you. You don't want to go to hell. You do not want to go to hell, trust me. It's an awful, awful, awful place. And you never get out. And Jesus is here this morning and he wants to save you. The Lord died for your sins on the cross. Come on, come on, come on right now. Come on. Others are coming, others are coming. Maybe these are praying for loved ones and family and friends. Come on, come on right now. Maybe you're saved, but you say, Preacher, I wouldn't want to die living like I'm living. Preacher, I'd want to get my heart right. I'd want to get my heart right. I don't want to die in the shape I'm in. Come on. Ain't nothing to be ashamed of, people. Truth is known. Every one of us ought to be up here. Let's all get in here and, and, and obey God. Come on, come on right now while we wait, while we pray, while we wait. You come right now, will you? Come on right now. Amen, amen. Just get out of your seat and come, friend. One day, it'll be too late. When this man died, he never got another chance. When this man died, it never opened up for him again. He had his last warning. And he waited too late. Is that going to be you? Am I going to have to stand up here and say, I hope he made it. Hope he made things right. Hope she made things right. Please don't do that. Settle it right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get out of your seat right now. Come on. Settle this thing. Big man. Little man. Young man. Old man. Teenager, young child, little girl, little boy, you come right now. Come on. Come on. Just get out of your seat. Right now, you feel God tugging at your heart right now. Come on. Come on right now. You may have 12 hours to live and not even know it. It's no accident I preach this sermon. It's no accident. God's speaking to your heart. Will you let him? Will you let him? We'll wait just a few seconds. Christians pray. Christians pray. Christians pray, will you let God speak to your heart, will you?
Will you? Will you let God speak to your heart? He'll help you if you'll let him. He'll help you if you'll let him. Wait about 10 seconds. Come on, this is for you, friend. This is for you. Come, come on, right now, come on. Step out right now. You can do it. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Get it over with. Settle it right now. Come on, come on. God, God may send a great revival if you'll step out. Why don't you come? 12 hours to live. You let him? You gonna let him? You gonna let him? You gonna let him? You gonna pray. We're gonna pray. Thank God for these to come. All right. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you so much for every person that's heard this message and the other many, many, many hundreds of thousands that will hear it. I pray that you'd use it to bring souls into the family of God, save lost souls, change lives, touch hearts. I pray for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who may be here this morning, Lord, who may be saying no, holding out, holding off. God, help them to make that step that they need to make before it's everlasting too late. And I ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right.